New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. There has been no more noble fight in all of American history than the one to guarantee equal rights to formerly enslaved Americans. So how did we forget about the efforts of a black congressman and a Civil War veteran president to ensure that all those Union soldiers hadn't died in vain? And more importantly, that we fully paid back, in Abraham Lincoln's words, every drop of blood that had been drawn by the lash. We had to make sure that all those post-Civil War amendments to the Constitution guaranteeing equal rights to the freedmen weren't just ink on a page, empty words to be laughed at by marauding lynch mobs aimed at restoring the Confederacy under the name of Jim Crow. In this episode, our time machine travels back to meet this inspiring odd couple who teamed up to finish the work of liberty, only to have their job cut tragically short by an assassin's bullet leaving us with a really heartbreaking what if. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This is where you come to track down hidden figures from yesterday so that they can inspire us today. Joining us on this mission is Benjamin R. Justison. He brings us Forgotten Legacy, William McKinley, George Henry White, and the struggle for black equality. Ben Justison is a former journalist, teacher, and U.S. Foreign Service officer who has written three previous books on Congressman White, so that tells you he really knows this fellow, and he really loves him, and you're going to love him too. One of those books found its way all the way to the Oval Office, and those of you watching on YouTube can see it here in the hands of the first black president of the United States, Barack Obama. That's Ben Justison's biography titled George Henry White, An Even Chance in the Race of Life. Okay, as you can tell, I'm excited about this episode, so let's get started. Now that we've arrived back at the turn of the last century, let's welcome aboard Ben Justison and recover William McKinley and George Henry White's forgotten legacy. I'm joined via Zoom by Ben Justison. He's the author of Forgotten Legacy. William McKinley, George Henry White, and the struggle for black equality. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Dean, it's my pleasure to be here, and it's always fun to talk about both McKinley and George White at one time. Yes, I enjoy talking about McKinley. People will know I read a lot about him. And so, hey, now I have a a new hero to go there with him. This is kind of like when they used to have the comic books, right? They'd have a crossover or they'd add a new character, something that people push to the wayside. They didn't really want McKinley to be that interesting because he's followed by Theodore Roosevelt, which, as I always say, is like being the opening act for the Rolling Stones. He had all those boisterous children in the White House. He had this great exciting recent war record because McKinley certainly was was more of a soldier saw all four years I think he was in the war right he enlists when he's very young I think 17 or 18 but those things by modern eyes have been forgotten because TR was such a great showman McKinley just isn't one of those presidents that's staring up at us from a bill he used to be on the ten dollar bill but he hasn't been there since 1929 he was displaced for Alexander Hamilton and if you're a president and you get forgotten then imagine how Congressman White is. He's all the more forgotten. So where did you find them? You didn't just look at a $10 bill. How did you meet the two of them and decide to write Forgotten Legacy? Well, Forgotten Legacy actually uh, began with my uh, first couple of books about George White. And I met George White when I was a reporter or met his name for the first time when I was a newspaper reporter back in the 1970s, I'd never heard of him before. Over the years, I got more and more interested in him and finally wrote my first book as his biography. The more research I did into George White's life, one book just wasn't enough. This is my fourth and I think final book about George White. I discovered that the other characters in his life were sometimes just as interesting as he was. I'd I'd never thought much about William McKinley being an an interesting person, but the more I read about him, the more interested I got. 
he was just sort of, to me, a little stern and distant looking. And I realized at some point that the only way to tell the last of the stories about George White was to tell it as in terms of his partnership or alliance or friendship, whatever you want to call it, with William McKinley, whom he greatly admired. Uh, so that was what led me eventually to write this book, which is the tale of two very private men who became allies in a very unusual setting and were, I think, tried very hard to accomplish some things that no other two people like them, no other president and congressman, freshman congressman, could ever have, have done before or since. I mentioned that McKinley was remembered at the time, beloved at the time, but very soon was forgotten, fell out of the national memory. And I have a yeah. couple of books here that I wanted to show. And these are these are from the period of his assassination about 1901. This is mm -hmm. the authentic life of President William McKinley, the yeah. memorial edition. And so that's one. So, I mean, that gives you an idea. You know, people wanted to pick these up and remember them. And this one's from the same period. This one is the memorial life of William McKinley, our martyred president. And I pointed out to you that you could tell I actually did read through this because. Yeah. <laughs> you do so, what I do. I'm going to go back and read that again. right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I just found it very interesting that here's a guy who is president and gets forgotten. And, in, and then you introduced me to a congressman who's likewise been forgotten. And so that's a point of real pride for you, or should be as an author, that you've been able to bring this man back. That's something that I just love to do is find somebody from the past and say, wow, look at what they tried to do. In his case, unfortunately, George Henry Wright was not as successful as he might have been. And also it challenges our assumptions at the time. You call McKinley and White a unlikely pair in the book, an unlikely pair. And you say a distinguished Midwestern governor known for his dignified political skill. He's a fatherly guy. As you mentioned, he looks a little stern in those pictures looking at us sometimes. And then you have this spellbinding black order who is a teacher, he's a lawyer. He makes himself, he makes his career and he becomes a success. And it really belies where he came from which is from the turpentine swamps of the rural South. And yet what we might assume is flipped. McKinley doesn't even graduate college. He's the last president we had who did go to college. And yet George Henry White is a guy who is very well educated and is a, an, a prosecutor even, which is something else. You, you think just to be a lawyer as a black man in the South would have been difficult enough, but he's a prosecutor and he's a prosecutor demanding to stand on equal footing. So what will readers learn about these men and that makes them worthy of a book that makes them worthy of our admiration today. I think it's, uh, it was almost a, a symbiotic relationship that they saw things in each other that mirrored their own beliefs. They were, they recognized something each one did in the other guy that was compelling, that really touched the chord McKinley was not a discriminating person at all by race. He treated everyone exactly as the next person who walked in the room and the color of a man's skin just didn't matter to him. It did to a lot of people, but not to McKinley. And George White, who had fought for years in North Carolina when he was becoming a prosecutor to demand that he be treated just like every other person who walked in the room, I think recognized immediately that McKinley was uh, truthful, decent, and perceptive. I think the two of them knew that they could work together from the first minute they met each other. And although McKinley had many other things on his mind and the Spanish-American War soon took his attention away from what George White was uh, pursuing, they never lost that, that connection, that nexus, if you will, that they understood each other and they recognized each other for 
not for what they could do for each other, but for sharing a, a similar belief, set of beliefs. I would imagine because of the segregation and social rules at the time, it's not as if he would just walk into a bar or they would be at the same church or even at the same part of the bus where they would just meet there in Washington, D.C. Granted, he's a member of Congress, but I wanted you to set that up for us. Say you're taking us back and we're going to be there at this meeting of two people that are like friends to you. Where is it? The first time that I actually know they met was in McKinley's office in the White House. They may have met before in passing, perhaps even in St. Louis at the 1896 convention, although I don't think so. But <clears throat> George White went to the White House in the company of North Carolina's Republican Senator, a man named Jeter Pritchard, in the last week of March, 1897, to be backup for Pritchard in the appointment of someone from North Carolina. And that was when McKinley and White met for the first time officially. McKinley would have, I'm only guessing, probably just shaken hands, said, how are you, Mr. Congressman? And Mr. Congressman would have said, Mr. President, it's my pleasure. And they would have sized each other up and Pritchard would have been standing there. Pritchard was a very close friend of McKinley's as it, uh, over the years. And I think he would not have brought White with him if he had not thought that the president would take to him immediately. George White was, um, could sometimes be a bit um, standoffish until he got talking and then it would, people would just, kind of sit down and sink into their chairs and listen to him talk because he had one of these voices uh, like some other famous black orators who just, I could listen to him all day, I think people would say. Anyway, I think um, McKinley just probably took the measure of him and said, you know, this is a man that I can work with. And if I need something, I know who to go to. And Jeter Pritchard would be standing there beside him saying, Mr. President, you're exactly right. Now, I tell you that because it's a little funny that later Jeter Pritchard and George White fell out in a big way. I mean, they became almost mortal enemies before uh, McKinley died. And McKinley himself drifted away from George White but I don't think they ever lost respect for each other at all. I think it was political. Their, their parting was just inevitable. Must have been hard. It was harder for uh, White than I think it was for McKinley because he, uh, McKinley just had so much on his plate, so much to do, so many things that he compartmentalized himself in some ways. And I think he, he still met with him several times, um, even after George White left Congress, he met with McKinley. So the, the relationship continued, but the closeness had begun to sort of recede and there was um, less of a need for them to know each other. But I think that they brought out the best in each other and the situation around them was also bringing out the worst in in both their situations. So it's kind of a tension that developed. Probably. Frustration. Yeah, frustration. And the subhead mentions the struggle for black equality. Yes. You mentioned the arc of them trying, of them having some success and then ultimately not being able to reach their goal. What would you call McKinley and White's greatest success and their greatest disappointment in that struggle? Well, I, I think, although I, I may cause a lot of argument on the point, that it was the anti-lynching bill that White introduced in Congress at the beginning of 1900. And I believe that McKinley had been pushed by the members of the new National Afro-American Council to do something about lynching. He was already primed for it. He'd spoken about it in his inaugural address and in his 1899 
uh, addressed to Congress, he mentioned it again. He said that uh, lynching was a scourge on the American uh, psyche. It should be, those weren't his exact words, but it should be abolished. There was no place in this country for, for lynching. And George White was in total agreement, but George White probably expected too much of McKinley in terms of getting the bill through Congress. That was not McKinley's bent. He did not push things. He did not get out and lead things. He was perfectly willing to endorse privately the concept of an anti lynching bill and let George White lead it through Congress. But George White probably was not as skilled in getting people to sign on to his bill. He thought that all he had to do was make wonderful speeches, which were great speeches, but nothing happened. And he was disappointed. So I think that was the beginning of their drifting apart when White realized that McKinley was not going to stand up and fight for this bill. McKinley could not in an election year do that. It would have been tantamount to writing off the South, any votes in the South, if he had done it. And it was not the way that he handled things politically anyway. He thought, he thought White understood that he had to go out and do the legwork, the gritty work that it was up to. George White. And George White thought that everybody else would be flocking to his side saying that this bill is irresistible. We have to vote for it. Well, that's just not the way it was. So I think the two of them had a different idea about what this bill meant and a very different idea about who should take it up. There's one other person involved in this, and that is uh, McKinley's vice president, Garrett Hobart, Gus Hobart, who died just before um, White introduced the bill. And that was probably the end of the bill before it was ever introduced, which, because Hobart would have been responsible in the Senate for making sure that such a bill actually got pushed through and that no filibuster uh, killed it. With Hobart gone, that the Senate was uh, probably never going to happen. It was never going to be an approval. So the bill stayed in the Judiciary Committee, and that was the end of that. Never saw it again. Hobart was a good leg man. Yeah. When that Gus Hobart died in November 1899, I think that was the death knell for any a successful anti-lynching bill. Uh, the anti-lynching bills have a history of, if they even make it through the House, of dying in the Senate e anyway. The most recent one is still being held hostage in the Senate, and it was no different back then. But Gus Hobart, if anyone could ever have pulled it off, he might have been able to. Hobart is a fellow Rutgers graduate, which I definitely have to mention. And yep. From New Jersey, and talk about a forgotten one right there, was Garrett Hobart. If you pick up some of the older books, for instance, I have here, In the Age of McKinley, the Pulitzer Prize winner by Margaret Leach. Mm -hmm. And it may amuse you to know, because I really like McKinley, right? I, have a, I also have a backup one of the exact same book, just in case, because you can never have too much McKinley in your house, right? So... <laughs> I, books like that you hear about this legacy and then as we get to more modern books which people watching via youtube can see behind me for instance president mckinley by robert w mary who i interviewed people can find that conversation in the archives yeah there's maybe a paragraph about mckinley on race it's almost as if even if someone wants to write a book about him they've just absorbed this bias and they want to protect him from it and let's not look too deeply meanwhile the guy enlists to fight in the civil war he fights for the grand army of the republic he has a good record we all hear about theodore roosevelt having dinner at the white house with booker t washington but mckinley had dinner with him too he didn't have dinner with him at the white house but he did use his stature he was trying to get things done and so was george henry white and 
for instance, winning the election. You mentioned that you didn't want to lose all, all those Democratic votes in the South, the former Confederacy. Well, I look sometimes at their opponents and I say, I can see why. It would have been much worse. It would have been nice to go out and maybe give a thumping speech. But McKinley said at one point, even when somebody asked him, why don't you ever lose your temper? You're so mad at that guy. He's lying to your face. He's letting you down. And McKinley said, I've learned that it was always much better to hold my tongue, to keep my temper than it was to give into that temporary desire to get the pleasure of just letting fly because there was always more problems afterwards. And so I hope that people will step into his shoes here in Forgotten Legacy and understand that he didn't really wasn't looking for the credit. He wasn't looking to make himself feel better at that minute, but he was trying to do what he could and choosing his moments, which is just good governing. And yep. he's not silent on the topic either. In his 1897 inaugural address, McKinley brings up lynching. He tells the nation, he really admonishes the nation, lynching must not be tolerated in a great and civilized country like the United States. And as you mentioned, although it's not the scourge today that it was 120 years ago, thank God, but he did use what he could, use what Eisenhower called the hidden hand, I guess. And he tries to join powers or join forces with George Henry White to do that. And I think it's also worth noting that in the moment, he was still friends with William McKinley. He didn't feel betrayed and let down as African-Americans have been so many times on issues of civil rights. He understood. And the fact that they understood each other tells me that Forgotten Legacy is not just a book that I occasionally get across my desk where you wanted to write it, you wanted to squeeze the two of them together and you were going to do it. They had a legitimate relationship and it's just a tragedy, not only that they didn't succeed, but even if they didn't make it all the way to the mountaintop, so to speak, to borrow from Dr. King, nobody built on their work for a long time and pushed it the rest of the way. That is just one of the, the sad things about an era like this one in which uh, George White and McKinley were on the same stage at different times. I think that, um, you know, we mentioned Hobart earlier and I'll just pull him in one more time. He and McKinley were very good friends. McKinley and Hobart and their wives went together, went away together for vacations and the um, McKinleys would go over to the Hobart's house on Lafayette Square uh, in the afternoon to get out of the White House because they could, in some ways, totally relax, not have to do anything else except just have a small social hour, talk to each other about things that mattered to them. And I often wondered if they thought of inviting George White, but that would probably not have been permissible because it would have um, just wasn't allowed in the, the current circumstances. So George White and McKinley could meet in the president's office or if the president came to Congress, he could see him there. But I do think that they all understood each other. Hobart was a very private man as well, but he was, he thought the world of McKinley and would have done anything for him. It's just that he had the misfortune to have a, a bum ticker, as they say, and it just didn't last. I hope that um, when, when the final story is written, if there's another story to be written about William McKinley, that people will remember that everything they've always known about him is sometimes not nearly enough. <laughs> There's always something new to know, something new to learn. George White, I think, is one of those hidden things that people can learn about William McKinley when they read Forgotten Legacy, I hope. Well, and you really are able to understand them too and their times and things like what you said about not inviting him over or not, not hanging out socially. That's for the really the protection and benefit of both of them and more so George Henry White in that world. If he 
been seen there rising above his station you know it makes us our skin crawl now to think of all the the terms and the things that would have been said but it wouldn't have done him any favors and certainly not his, his family any favors to do that and it's terrible that that's the world that they lived in but they were trying to change it and so i i think again i keep coming back to the fact that they did spend so much time together and that george henry white and mckinley both pursued the politics of what was possible and they yeah. tried to do the best that they could. Not everything worked out for them, but they did have successes along the way. And for instance, one of them is also right here in New Jersey, as was Garrett Hobart, as is his final resting place in Patterson, New Jersey. And that's the town of Whitesboro. And that's an interesting one because in our current climate, people occasionally every now and then will come up where they assume that the name Whitesboro must have a racial connotation. And it was meant to keep people who were non-white out but it was named after this man, this great African-American congressman who put it together. What does the founding of that town, Whitesboro, New Jersey, down in South Jersey, mean to his legacy? In many ways, I think it's, it's his greatest single legacy of all. He didn't found the town in order to have it named after him. He founded it as a mecca for blacks who were being oppressed in the South. It was a very small experiment, sort of a utopian experiment, to see just what uh, hardworking, committed Blacks could do in their own town. He wanted to create everything. He, he built the first school there. He wanted to build factories there. But he mostly wanted to make small lots and farms available at a good price to people who wanted to show that they could work with their hands and create their own future. The town is still there, although it's no longer a municipality. I think it was disbanded in the 1950s. But it still has uh, every Labor Day a homecoming festival. And that homecoming festival tends to bring back all the people who grew up in Whitesboro, including my good friend, Stedman Graham, who is best known in one uh, capacity as the friend of Oprah Winfrey, but he is also a very uh, distinguished speaker and brand marketing specialist. He travels around the world promoting certain programs and he came from Whitesboro. That's where he grew up. Huh. And he, used to, he told me once that uh, he was told when he was growing up there that nothing good ever comes out of Whitesboro. That's what he had drilled into his head his entire childhood. And that was simply not true. He was a very superior example of what came out of Whitesboro. He grew up knowing who George White was, only people who lived in Whitesboro actually seemed to know who George White was. And Flip Wilson, the comedian, was also from Whitesboro. And there were a few <laughs> others from the first black Superior Court judge in Pennsylvania grew up there as well. So it's a, a living monument to him, I think. There's a, a George White museum there as well. You're enjoying my conversation with Ben Justison. He's the author of the book, Forgotten Legacy, William McKinley, George Henry White, and the Struggle for Black Equality. North Carolina Historical Review writes of his first book, which was called George Henry White, and even Chance in the Race of Life, that it's shrewd and insightful. The book offers an important reminder that before white supremacy and disenfranchisement, African-Americans exercised considerable political power in North Carolina and the South. I wanted to mention that political power because I spoke to somebody who is a descendant, a collateral descendant of William McKinley. He has no living descendants, unfortunately, his two daughters died young, but Jack Massey McKinley. He's vice president and chief of staff of the Society of Presidential Descendants. I asked him how his great, great uncle saw the fight for equality and how he sought to broaden the Republican Party's appeal to African-Americans. Here we go. Some of the genes of McKinley, who, by the way, you could see his signature right here over your book. That's a, an actual yeah. McKinley autograph from one of his checkbooks. But let's, let's answer Jack McKinley's question. What do you think 
would have been the role of McKinley in getting the party of Lincoln to fulfill the promises of Abraham Lincoln and not just take them for granted at the ballot box, which would have been very easy for McKinley to do. You know, in many ways, McKinley was a quiet uh, cheerleader for people to live up to their potential. Uh, one of the things that he did that caught my attention as a former college teacher is that he went to historically black colleges and universities and spoke. He was not the only president who ever did that, but he went to more than anyone else. He went to four different ones that I've been able to find. And he also went to a very large black church in Chicago where he spoke not just as president, but as friend. He was offering what he believed to be the best advice he could give. I think he knew that certain things were probably not going to happen, that political equality was failing in the South. The four colleges he spoke at in the South were doing their best to teach black students how to make the best of what they had to improve themselves, to gain skills, to become good tradesmen and go on to professions, those who could. But his words to them were almost always, make the best you can of what you have, be a good citizen, be a good American. And very few people treated black audiences as equals, but McKinley was being honest with them, saying, you, you have the burden, I understand that, but if you do this, you will have a far better life than if you throw up your hands and say nothing can be done. He pushed as hard as he could. He praised their patriotism, and he praised their drive, and he praised their desire for an education, but the message was, it's really going to be up to you. Remember these words, it's up to you. You mentioned the weight of events, of national events, the Spanish-American War, the economic depression that McKinley finds staring him in the face when he goes into office the first time there, takes that inaugural oath in 1897. And of course, then the Spanish-American War comes, despite McKinley's efforts, another part of his legacy that is unknown and forgotten, and in fact, is often distorted, and he's made to sound like a warmonger and an imperialist, but he did try to avoid that war with Spain. He tried very, very hard to do that. The Congress threatens to declare war over his head, basically, the war hawks yeah. in Congress. And that's one thing that TR is mad about, that he says, well, he has all the backbone of a chocolate eclair of McKinley, which is particularly hilarious and not to mention delicious, but it is also very vivid. <laughs> and yet he's the one who gets the peace prize, right? I mean, he, this is the thing, sometimes in history, we look at things very binary. Well, McKinley has to have all the vices and TR has to be the knight in shining armor with the Rough Riders, which by the way, is why I chose this baseball cap that I'm wearing, which is a, it's a Saskatchewan Rough Riders hat, granted. So it's not an American hat, but with all of those events, it would have been so easy for both men to just shrug them off and to say, well, we'll, we'll get to you tomorrow. And that's something we hear again and again. And it's a, there's a speech out there that Rod Serling gave, interviewed his daughter about her book, As I Knew Him, my dad, Rod Serling. You know, we're always telling people, well, be quiet, just wait. You just have to be patient. It's, I understand. I agree. We should do it. But now's not the time. And I felt when I was reading Forgotten Legacy that here we have McKinley and White always keeping this very difficult issue right in the front when it would be so easy to say, oh, hey, this more important stuff came up. Sorry, I, I can't deal with it now, but I really want to and sort of pat people on the back and shoo them out of the office. And so how did McKinley and White persist despite the weight of all those national events? One of the things that George White did at the outset of the war, just before the war was declared, he decided that he wanted to have a fifth black army regiment, an artillery regiment. We already had two infantry and two cavalry regiments in the army. And he went, proposed in the house that an artillery regiment be created. Uh, that was 
sort of a, a non-starter of an issue because Congress wasn't ready to do that just yet. But after the war was declared, he went to McKinley and he said, uh, Mr. President, we need to encourage black volunteers for this uh, battle. We need more black volunteers. And the president agreed, told him he would back whatever uh, measures that uh, McKinley, that uh, White and others could come up with. And as it happened, the immune regiments, which are a very unusual uh, concept that came to the Spanish-American War to the foreground in the Spanish-American War, were to be composed of volunteer soldiers who had had yellow fever and were therefore presumed to be immune to a recurrence of it. That turned out to be scientifically almost always true. It didn't solve the problem because it turned out that just because you had yellow fever didn't mean you couldn't get malaria. And that's what a lot of the soldiers in the immune regiments ended up dying of was malaria. But McKinley said, I will make four or five of these 10 immune regiments, black regiments. And he went one step further. His own War Department says, well, Mr. President, it's great to bring in black soldiers, but they can't command themselves. They have to have white officers. And McKinley sort of looked at them. I can see him doing it right now saying, We'll see about that. And it turned out that while in the federal regiments, white officers were still required, in the state volunteer regiments, which were grafted into the army, they had their own black officers and it was because McKinley insisted that they have it. So even while he was distracted by this awful war that he did not want, he still found ways to involve people, to to live by the same principles he lived at before. He said, if we're going to have black soldiers and I want them, we're going to have black officers as well. After the war was over, he appointed nearly 100 black officers in the volunteer regiments that went to the Philippines. And people were shaking their heads going, this is never going to work. Like Teddy Roosevelt saying, they can't command themselves. And it turned out to be that he was right and they were wrong. They could command themselves and they did with distinction. And it doesn't stop Theodore Roosevelt from welcoming them along with him. Speaking of the Rough Riders, it's the black regiments that say, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll go take that hill with you. Let's knock those Spanish troops out of there. Yeah. And the regulars say, well, we're not going to follow this volunteer bespeckled big toothed guy you know <laughs> it's the buffalo soldiers that join that push yep. and really shame the white regular troops into joining this volunteer regiment those are all great things that are accomplished on mckinley's watch and because of his persistence on these things and he names almost as many african americans to federal offices as all of his predecessors combined just in those first two years of his yep. office and I wondered, since we have George White, what role did he play in those appointments? Was he coming in? This was past the peak of the age of patronage, but it certainly was a time of patronage. So I want people to know that George White and McKinley were both people who, they weren't just looking for token appointments. They weren't looking to check a bunch of diversity boxes, especially since those boxes certainly did not exist at this time where people were clamoring for X number of, at least in the nation at large, X number of people that would command a regiment or be a postmaster in a town or something. So what do we see today from that legacy of, of George Henry White and McKinley when we look at African-American representation in federal jobs? The time when McKinley began appointing uh, to patronage appointments in the federal government was a curious time. Uh, many of the uh, government positions had already been converted to civil service and they were no longer available for uh, appointment. But there were still about half of them, half of the federal government was still appointed every four years under a president. And McKinley was mm -hmm. determined to pick good people, 
people that were recommended to him, but also to, to look for good people that he knew. During, before and during the war, he had already appointed hundreds, perhaps even thousands of black into the federal workforce, uh, all the way from manual laborers at Navy Yards to two U.S. ministers to uh, Haiti and Liberia, which were black countries. And he was getting a lot of assistance from George White, especially for postmasters, whom you mentioned. There were about 100 black postmasters that McKinley appointed, including uh, more than 40 in North Carolina, but most of whom George White recommended. I think that by the time he, the end of 1901, just after his death, I found a, a figure that said he had appointed perhaps as many as 12,000 or had appointed, had hired as many as 12,000 black workers in the federal workforce, about a about 10 to 12 percent of the federal workforce was black at that time. Others, other presidents before him had done that, but never on this scale. He was um, committed to making fair opportunities available to fair people. And, by the way, he appointed female postmasters at a faster rate than any president before him, which I thought was kind of unusual. But then he was uh, married to a sort of a closet suffragette. His wife and his wife's family were all uh, in favor of giving women the vote. And he, he did his best for that little effort. It would take another 20 years after he was dead for it to happen. And postmaster generals were significant back then. It wasn't just you're running a post office. So I want to put people's shoes or put their feet in the shoes at the time. Those are important jobs to hold. And a job that was one that picture putting somebody in. In fact, there's a case, right, where one of these postmasters is killed. So these weren't just token appointments. They were important. They were. The uh, postmaster you're thinking of is a man named Frazier Baker, who was appointed in South Carolina against the wishes of uh, the white Democrats in the state, but the Republican Party in the state of South Carolina was still rather influential. And they recommended Frazier Baker, who had been a postmaster before at another small town in uh, South Carolina. And after about six months on the job, he was, they tried to drive him out of town and he wouldn't leave brought his family down instead and so one night a, a group of um, marauding mask killers drove up and set fire to the post office where he was living the only place he could find to put a post office in and called on him to, to come out and as he came out they shot him in the doorway of his house well his wife and uh, Five other children escaped, but he was carrying his uh, infant daughter, his youngest one, in his arms when he was shot. This just absolutely infuriated the president. I think he, he came as close to probably crying over anything as he did during his whole four years in office because he could not believe it. He had told people that no matter what they said, he was going to appoint the postmasters he wanted to appoint, black or white, and no one was going to stop him. And at this point, he calls in uh, his new attorney general, John Griggs, who was New Jersey's former governor and protege of Gus Hobart, said, it's going to be up to you now. You're going to have to, to prosecute this case, and I want you to prosecute it. And he did. A year later, they actually had one of the uh, most famous trials of winchers ever held in the South, in South Carolina. The trial did not end well, it ended in a mistrial, but they actually got five or six votes for conviction. And one report, the, the lead defendant was 11 to one, but could not get that 12th vote. Anyway, I think that McKinley who had always opposed lynching personally, was so angry at this that he said, we must do something. 
the trial was to be his uh, his last word on lynching, I think. And when that didn't go through, that's when he came back and announced it in his 1899 address that he was still opposed to lynching. And that's when George White introduced the bill. There's so many things that were going on that the country was changing. The country was losing interest in the issue. And McKinley, I think, was shaking his head going, but wait, there's so many things we haven't done yet. We're not being fair to our, our black citizens. You know, we, we may not be able to keep Jim Crow segregation from settling across the country, but we can surely retain civility with lynching. We can keep allowing them to vote. And I think he was still shaking his head when he died. He could not believe what the country was doing to itself. You mentioned him coming close to crying and to give people an idea of what kind of man William McKinley was. There is that famous story, I believe by one of his secretaries, but not a cabinet secretary, but a, a personal secretary. And he goes out onto that balcony at the White House and he finds the president in tears, you know, tearing up, crying. And he says, Mr. President, what's the matter? And he says, the way that they are pushing me, how they push me in Congress for this war with Spain. And it's, it's just overwhelming. I feel overwhelmed by it. And he wants to go back inside. And he says, I, I don't want, I didn't want anyone to see me crying and being so emotional over this. And so now I have to go back in there. And the aide has a great idea. I wish I could remember. It could have been George Cordelou or somebody like that. And he says, uh, take out your handkerchief and blow your nose when you go in. And mm -hmm. then when you have red eyes and everyone will think, oh, well, he's just because he blew his nose. It's not because he's crying. So he Excellent really, <laughs> even though he looked, I mean, I've, I've yet another McKinley book here that, you know, I mean, that doesn't look like a guy that's real emotional. And I mean, that, that's partially the style of the time, but he looks very serious and staid and not, not terribly emotional or, or passionate guy, but he was, and that was that was part of the way. I think if you were inscrutable like that, if you were a sphinx, if you, at one point, they described him as a statue walking around in his search of a pedestal to go stand on, right? <laughs> so th that was something, and he did accomplish so much. It's too bad that, because we do look at the physical and we are drawn naturally to a guy like Theodore Roosevelt who's so excited that we forget about what he actually did and the accomplishments. You write, for instance, in Forgotten Legacy, William McKinley's role as a sincere friend and benefactor of African-Americans may be one of the best kept secrets in American political history. And I sure like that one. And it made me think of how many white Americans at the time thought that binding up the nation's wounds from the Civil War and saying all these high-minded phrases like Americans never surrendered but to Americans and things like that did so by completely taking the easy route and saying, well, we can do that by getting rid of black people, keeping them out of the story. Let's, let's get rid of them. And this has been one of the complaints about that Ken Burns documentary. After 50 years, we want to see those pictures of these old Civil War soldiers from both sides, many missing limbs and eye patches, and they're embracing over the line of Pickett's Charge, the high water mark of the Confederacy. And uh, we just feel good about ourselves that, that America has been reunited. And that wasn't William McKinley that was going to write them out of the story and let Jim Crow gobble up the freedmen from the Civil War, people who were born into slavery and now are on paper free. How did McKinley go about making those words and those post-Civil War amendments fact and not just ink on a page? And what can we learn from that? Well, for one, he kept his friendships going quietly. He was friends with a man named John Roy Lynch, who had been a congressman in Mississippi in the 1880s. He actually served in Congress with eight of the 18 blacks who had been elected to Congress. And so he knew them well personally. When John Roy Lynch was a lawyer after he left Congress and he became um, the first person that McKinley thought of when he realized that he needed a new kind of uh, what they called a paymaster, an army paymaster officer, someone who actually took the job of paying the black soldiers. So he called in uh, at least two people that I can find. John Roy Lynch was one of them and uh, a man named Robert Wright, who was 
college president in Georgia was the other who served in the army as the black paymaster. And after the war was over, these were temporary commissions offered as majors to these two men and others. He called him back in and said, I want you to continue serving this capacity now as a regular officer. I'm going to have your job regularized if you'll take it. And uh, John Roy Lynch sort of looked at the president whom he had known now for 20 years. and He said, yes, sir, of course. <laughs> what else can I say? I'll be happy to do it. So whenever he would come home, he went to Cuba for a while. And when he come home from Cuba, he would go to the White House, first of all, and drop in on the president and say, here's what's really going on in Cuba, things you need to know about. And then he would go to Chicago where he was uh, living at the time. The president always remembered to tap people on the shoulder and say, by the way, you know, I need to hear what's happening out there. I'm not just going to weave the job up to you, but you're my eyes and ears on the ground. I think he did that with all the people he appointed they never forgot their loyalty to him, and he always used them to gain new insights into what was happening. As I say, he, he met with White after White left Congress for the last time. He was hoping to perhaps consider White for an appointment in the fall of 1901, but died before that could take place. He never failed to be kind and, and understanding and civilized with his friends. And that meant not just cultivating them, but actually listening to them. That was one of his special gifts, was listening to people. I'm not sure that many politicians have that real capacity these days. They're probably distracted by many things, but McKinley was famous for that, for listening. There was that saying about him that he kept his ear so close to the ground that he had grasshoppers in it. That's <laughs> I've heard <life>. that. <laughs> <laughs> but he knew what was going on. You know, that, that's a thing. And that's your job. And today we've automated, for lack of a better word, we have these giant staffs and you just can't find a substitute for retail politicking. Unfortunately, retail politicking is exactly what McKinley is doing against the urging of George Cordelou, who I just mentioned, his, his aide there, his chief secretary. And he tells him, don't do this today. You don't have to. You know, they're shooting kings and queens over in Europe. And McKinley says, well, who would want to hurt me? And of course, someone is in line to hurt him. And Cordelou urges him again. He says, well, you can't possibly shake hands. There's 20,000 people out there. And McKinley says, well, they'll know I tried anyhow. Then even after he's shot, he, he says, go easy on him, boys. And then when they continue to beat the assassin, he says, don't let them hurt him. I would never be able to do that. I don't, I think if somebody shot me twice, I would probably even never mind once, right? I'd probably be like, fine, you want to beat the guy? <laughs> go ahead. And uh, I mean, I'm not proud of that, but that's why we read history, right? I look at George Henry White and William McKinley and I say, these guys are, are better men than I am on a lot of these things. So the well, things that they're better than me on, let me learn from them from the pages of history. And that's what you helped us do here in Forgotten Legacy. I found both men just so fascinating. Well, and you know, the when McKinley was uh, struck by the the second shot, the one that eventually did kill him, there was a, a big, very big, tall, powerful black man standing in line right behind uh, Leon Shawgosh. James Benjamin Parker was from Georgia. He had come to hear McKinley speak, and he was so disappointed when he found out as he got closer to McKinley in the Temple of Music in Buffalo that he wasn't going to speak, that he almost turned around and left. He said, I've waited all this time and I'm not going to hear him speak. So he said, well, I guess I'm that close. I may as well just go up and shake his hand. And he was the next person after Shawgosh. So when Shawgosh shot him, uh, Parker, who had been a constable in Georgia, 
said he went into action. He grabbed him and threw him to the ground and was about to strangle him to keep him from firing that last what would have been fatal shot. And they had to pull him off and it took several men to pull him off. The sad thing about that story is not that it is uh, he didn't save him. The sad thing is that Parker was almost immediately written out of the picture. Everybody who was there saw it happen. But a couple of the Secret Service guys said, this doesn't look good for us, so let's just not mention him <laughs> in, in the next telling of the story. So he didn't even get to testify at the trial. Such as the trial was. Yeah, such as the trial. Well, not much of a trial. And one of the things that happened after the trial, but before the execution, which came on immediately, was that Parker came to Washington to speak in the first week of November, of October 1901. And George White went with him to the White House to introduce him to Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt, I think, uh, took his hand and that was about it, or maybe took his hand, I'm not sure. But he went out and spoke that night in Washington about what had happened to him and how it had changed his life. And people were accusing him of trying to make money on it. So I wasn't trying to make money on it. I was just trying to save my president's life. That's all. At that point, I think George White was shaking his head even more because he was introducing him to the crowd and thinking this is the man that almost saved the man who was my friend, my ally. Kind of a just a sad commentary on what was happening to everybody at the time. It's noteworthy that they try to write Jim Parker out of the story. They do write him out of the story after, but in the immediate days after the assassination, the immediate hours when there's that confusion, Black America holds their breath because they're so afraid that, oh gosh, was this guy in on it? Was it a, was it a Black American that tried to kill the president? And they know that they are in for of severe trouble to say the yeah. least speaking of lynching and burnings and all kinds of things and then there's such relief when they initially hear that that this man was a hero you know people are buying buttons cutting buttons off his shirt as souvenirs and just holding him up there's a song written at the time that in the language of the time was called the the negro was in it and it just describes how jim parker tried to save the president when the president was shot. And, and then there's this book, and this was an interview that I did that I think I'll go back and listen to, which is The Electrifying Fall of the Rainbow City by Margaret Crichton. And this is at that Temple of Music at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo of 1901, where McKinley loses his life. And that certainly puts a damper on that celebration, although Buffalo wasn't doing too great anyway. So I wanted to mention some of those books. I obviously have other ones back here behind me. Yeah. Major McKinley is one of those. That's the that's about his Civil War service. So people are looking to learn more about William McKinley. These are all excellent books to go back and dig in. I don't expect anyone to dig in as deeply as yourself and I have, but if people want to, they can. I hope they will. I hope that uh, books like this will uh, pique their imagination, get them to uh, read a little more and learn a little bit about uh, the hidden side of a man they thought they knew or they didn't think they needed to know. Got another one here. I'll show you that one since right. I mentioned it. Man, Major McKinley. There you go. Young, young kid, right? When he joins up. Yeah. Most people at 18 are not thinking, hey, I'm going to go to war and risk my life. And occupation duty he had in West Virginia. And he, he's at Antietam. He's heroic. He's actually gets a promotion for Bravery Under Fire at Antietam. Oh, right. Forgotten Legacy No More, thanks to the book titled Forgotten Legacy. I want to wrap up where you do, and that's with your epilogue. You mm -hmm. end with a quote by George Henry White. And the date is significant. It's June 7th of 1902. That's nine months after the McKinley assassination. George White laments his treatment at the census office. And he says, I have no redress now. It's a simple sentence, just those five words. I have no redress now. He has nowhere to go. He has no friend to help him out. He has no person in high office that he can appeal to. How might the lives of African-Americans have been different if they were able to continue working together, if George Henry White stays in Congress, and if William McKinley survives that assassin's bullet, if maybe James B. Parker realizes after the first shot to grab him, imagine how great that would have been for African-Americans. If they could have changed something to avoid that day, what 
does life look like for African Americans in the century that follows? Well, I think that it would have been a, a better world all around if they had both lived and continued to be active in politics. I think uh, McKinley was had announced that pretty much that he was not running again. He was not going to seek a third term. And I believe that at the back of his mind, he was thinking, what are the things that I could have I could accomplish if I no longer have to run? What kinds of um, changes can I make in public policy and, and the country that will make a better life for more Americans? I think that he would probably have considered making George White an appointee in some level, probably not in the cabinet, but maybe, who knows, we'll never know. But I think he would also have done things that were unorthodox because he, he knew that I've got this great opportunity. I can push Americans in ways that they've not been pushed before. Gently push them as their leader, as their loving leader, but make them listen to things that they've not been willing to listen to before. That was the sad part for me that he was, the speech he gave in Buffalo was a, a very farsighted speech talking about the, a world that's interconnected, a world that works together, a world in which uh, we try to help each other and ourselves, so don't forget ourselves. George White, I think, would have been uh, a much bigger player in some ways under uh, continuing President McKinley than he ever would be under another president. He, he just left politics completely. He gave up after what happened to him in 1902 and years after that. He felt that it was not worth the effort to uh, hang himself out to dry because he had no one to help him. So he moved to Philadelphia, and that's when he began uh, pursuing his uh, other loves in life, land development, banking, always seeking to help people make a little money. Yes, he had to survive, but he wanted to help. He wanted to help lift his brace up and set an example for them. And he did that, I think, in a much quieter way on a, a backwater stage in a small part of New Jersey, but he did it. He, did, he never stopped. I think McKinley would have said, that's the kind of man I thought he was. He was that kind of man. He never stopped. Well, what a man he is. I was just so great to be able to add him here to my bookshelf, add him to my list of heroes. He certainly earned a place. I know I have many McKinley books, but this one's special because you get to see him <laughs> through somebody else's eyes. So yes. that's why I wanted to share it. So Benjamin Justison, thank you so much for sharing Forgotten Legacy with me today and for adding George Henry White to my list of historical heroes right alongside William McKinley. I choose to take this story as an inspiration. Do what you can, when you can, and don't don't wait for another time. That another day might never come. So I wish you the best of luck with the book. I hope that readers will catch my McKinley flu here and decide that, hey, we all, we all want to learn a little bit about this guy. And now if you don't want to learn about him, you also get to learn about George Henry White. So exactly. George Henry White, what a guy, right? It's, it's just an exciting story. Somebody who I feel you're opening the book and saying, wait a minute, this African-American guy was not only in Congress, but he accomplished so much and he had a president who was working with him. To me, this book is a real gift and I thank you so much for writing it. I hope that people will pick it up, check out Forgotten Legacy and any of the other McKinley books that I have here, certainly <laughs> the Forgotten Legacy first and foremost, because I think this book has real appeal outside just people who love presidential history. I wish you the best of luck with it. Well, thank you so much, Dean. It's been such a pleasure to uh, talk to someone else who understands a little bit of uh, what I was trying to do because it elevates both of them, your man McKinley, my man White, at the same time. Again, the book is Forgotten Legacy, William McKinley, George Henry White, and the Struggle for Black Equality.
As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying this book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. I can't thank Ben Justison enough for joining us and shining a light on the uplifting story of William McKinley and George Henry White joining forces to fight for equality at a time that everybody else was saying, well, it can't be done, go slow, patting African Americans on the head and saying, someday, just not today. Looking back, it's so easy to say historical figures could have done more, of course, but it's also just as easy to excuse them for falling short. In this case, I hope I struck a good balance. Both of these men tried hard. And hey, I understand trying is not enough when you're having your house burned down or you're being lynched. But so many at the time, almost everybody else in a position to help was not only not trying, they were actively working to subjugate Americans based on the color of their skin. It's worth noting, by the way, that after George Henry White left the U.S. Capitol as a representative on that last day, no African American would walk back in as a representative from a southern state for 72 years. And it would be almost a century before George Henry White's native North Carolina sent a black man to the Capitol as a member of Congress. Let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean. You can also find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And I hope that everyone watching via YouTube enjoyed the clips and photographs that brought this story to life. If you did like this conversation, please do click the subscribe button and share this video around. Spread the word. Not for me, not for Ben Justison, but for George Henry White and William McKinley. I have one more McKinley book, by the way. It's right here. Those of you watching on YouTube can see it. It's Carl Rove's The Triumph of William McKinley. Why the Election of 1896 Still Matters. For those of you watching via that YouTube channel, you can see a picture of me with the former White House Deputy Chief of Staff sporting a coffee mug from the William McKinley Library and Museum in Canton, Ohio. That's McKinley's final resting place, by the way. It's an excellent historic site to visit. I would also encourage you to visit both in North Carolina and in Whitesboro, the places that are dedicated to George Henry White's forgotten legacy. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.